Duke Nukem Forever, Dead Space 3, Dead Rising 4, all of these games have one thing in common, and it's not that they have D in the name. They all destroyed their franchise, and I mean really destroyed. You're not getting another one of these unless the new game relentlessly mocks the old one, completely ignores it, or is a reboot. Franchise killers are just so fascinating because it shows how one bad outing, one bad employment of the IP can make the thing unattractive to publishers and audiences alike for years. And today we look at, in my opinion, one of the most insane franchise killers ever made. A piece of media that should be displayed in museums as a showcase of our staggering mismanagement, publisher interference, and overconfidence can turn even the most respected series into a barely talked about memory. A footnote in the history of a genre it once dominated. That's right, today we're talking about Fear 3, not washing my car, or cleaning my house, or paying my bills. Bills, we're talking about Fear 3, because that's the best use of my time, isn't it? Fear 3 has a place close to my heart, and it's not because I like it, it's because this is one of the first times I was genuinely disappointed by a game. Now, long-time viewers will know the story. Baby Brandos had a terrible laptop as a kid slash teenager that forced him to play nothing but old games. We're talking Half-Life, Bioshock, Stalker, every prolific series I could get to run and get my hands on. It was an exciting time for me, and it shaped me into who I am today. I still remember counting down the days till the Steam sale so I could get that bundle of famous old games. I'd heard of these things. I'd heard of how they'd shaped the landscape of gaming today. So every new game felt like I was experiencing history. Then along came fear. In 2019, I got all the games and booting them up, well, you've seen the other videos, right? Right. Come Fear 3 though, I wasn't ready for what I experienced. Up until that point, I had enjoyed the series as a whole. I had immersed myself in the lore and jumping into Fear 3 was like a cold bucket of water. This game felt like the writer read the story of the other games with his eyes closed. This game felt like I could sue it for false advertising with how unscary it was. This game felt like every game I had played in the last few years and somehow felt nothing like Fear. But for those who don't know, pretty much Fear 3 is is a co-op FPS horror where you play as either Paxton Fettle or Point Man. It takes place nine months after Fear 1 and the story is that Paxton and Point Man are trying to find Alma. I guess I don't really know. They spend a lot of this game just running around in places. I mean, what else can you say in a summary? Fear 3 is shockingly bare bones and this is thanks very much to the hellish development cycle that the game went through for about four four years straight. Now, before we get into this, I do want to put out a little disclaimer because this is a weird kind of case where this is a really bad game, but the developers were equally kind of fucked in this situation. I want to make it very clear that I'm a fan of the Fear series and I am speaking from a place of disappointment. None of what I'm about to say in this video is directed at the developers because I know how much the developers were the real victims here. You know, a bigger victim than Baby Brandos playing the third video game that in a series he bought and going like, oh, this isn't what I want to know. So please just understand where I'm coming from, from a place of criticism in this video and who I'm directing at. It's not the developers. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk development because this one is fascinating. Not only for how downright horrible it all was, but how consistently it keeps with the fear quality scale. See, Fear 1 was a pretty good game with all round not that many development issues. Fear 2 was a pretty okay game with some development issues. Fear 3 is a pretty bad game with development issues that make Cold War geopolitics look like a minor disagreement. Okay, that's a minor overstatement, but I mean seriously minor. To set the stage, remember when I was talking about Fear 2 and I said this. While Monolith was developing Fear 2, Vivendi was developing their own version of Fear 2 as well, but I won't be talking about that because this Fear 2 morphed into Fear 3, which we'll talk about this time. So yeah, Fear 2 started life at Vivendi in 2006, around the time that all the rights issues began kicking off. Monolith had access to Fear's story, its characters, its locations. Vivendi had the name and the in-universe organization. So with these two admittedly major feathers in their cap, they went to a game developer called Day One Studios and told them to make them a Fear sequel. Now you guys are going to love this. Vivendi chose Day One Studios for this project because they had ported Fear 1 to the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2006. And yes, 
these were the ports that were so bad, it made Monolith attempt to develop three separate versions of Fear 2 on their side of the fence. It's like development problems inception. <laughs> if you think about it, not having access to the first game's story or characters or anything actually gave them a lot of freedom. They didn't have to follow up with a plot line they didn't write. All they had to do was make it their Fear 2. So getting to work, they came up with an outline. And just before we get into this, I want to thank YouTuber Dead Domain for their awesome work on their criminally underrated Fear 3 documentary, where they interview developers about the behind the scenes of Fear 3. I mean, just going on the Fear 3 Wikipedia page, a huge part of the development section is sourced from this video. We would not know a majority of the things that went on at day one during development without their video. So huge props to them. There's a link in the description for anyone who wants more Fear 3 content after this and wants to watch content from someone who is considerably more professional than me. Anyway, the Vivendi Fear 2 was about phasing technology. There's not a lot of info out there, but essentially the technology to open rifts was somehow misused, with the result being a massive portal is opened to a supernatural world called the World Behind the Walls. To shut it down, a fear team would be deployed, and that's the premise. And yeah, that sounds pretty sweet. I'd love to play- Oh no, guys, it's- it's Warner Bros. Yep, this was the fateful day. In September of 2008, Warner Bros purchased the rights to Fear back, making anything that was Fear related at the time theirs, including in development Fear games like our Vivendi Fear 2. Now Warner Bros looked at Fear 2 version 2 and said, hey, we already have a real Fear 2 in development, but do you know what we don't have? Fear 3? Fear 3, yes, make it happen. And just like that, 18 months of work on Fear 2 was gone, but this was just the beginning of the micromanaging Day One Studios had to endure. Fear 3 was now going to have to continue from the cliffhanger that Fear 2 left, and while Day One Studios wanted Brian Keane, a well-established horror author, to write the script, Warner Bros instead hired Steve Niles, who specialized in horror, but mostly for comic books. Now around this time, Steve was on a project with none other than John Carpenter, and yes, that John Carpenter, director of such obscure indie films such as Halloween, Dark Star, the Thing. So Steve Niles pretty much asked WB if he could bring Carpenter on as a co-writer and WB said yes because who doesn't want John Carpenter's name on their horror game? But things from here on out weren't completely rosy. Niles' first draft of the script was more similar to a movie screenplay and according to some day one employees, not only did he send in new drafts late regularly, but his material more often than not needed to be rewritten. None of this was helped by the fact that John Carpenter was reportedly playing playing the role of the ideas man, showing up to conference calls, giving inputs on story notes and cutscenes without much else. They had the mystical mind of John Carpenter on the project, and yet it seemed like he was just a name to put on the box. In other parts of the studio, things weren't great either. Initially being developed as a single player experience, Warner Bros began getting hands on, trying to shape the game into something that rode a lot of trends at the time. The first major change was the addition of co-op. Monolith encouraged a day want to explore the relationship between Point Man and Paxton Fettel. So adding him as a co-op partner, Day One had to retool multiple levels to make them compatible for two players. But the retooling didn't stop. Day One was continuously told to add in more set pieces, make the game more epic, make it more exciting. During this time, Day One was subject to insane crunch. We're talking 60 to 80 hour work weeks for around eight months. And let me remind you, this is crunch after three to four years years of development. So this continued on, many devs quit, the game was delayed a couple of times, and finally it was released in June of 2011. I mean, just what a story. This wasn't a situation like CD Projekt Red where they released Cyberpunk in a broken state and were able to get their rep back by fixing the thing. Fear 1 was put out and no one knew why I was so shit and they never got a chance to explain themselves. They got fucked so hard. And honestly, WB, this shit is embarrassing dude, no wonder you don't want anyone to remember the Fear series, holy crap. Just imagine pouring your passion into a project for nearly two years, only for that to be taken away from you, and then as you begin work on the new project, you get told you're doing it wrong every step of the way by people who probably think that Tetris is still next gen. Yeah, so the development of Fear 3 is just insane, it's a 
miracle it got released at all. And I want to once again state that I'm not trying to demean anyone's work that actually worked on Fear 3. My complaints, my jabs, these are all going towards the people who didn't do their research on what Fear is, who didn't trust the devs to do their job, who didn't respect the legacy of Fear and didn't even give a shit. So just know that this product I'm about to make fun of is not a passion project. This is a corporate product. It was made to ride the coattails of the trends of the early 2010s and it, it deserves everything it's got coming to it. I want you to take that in and we are going in. So buckle up. So the game starts with Oh, wait a minute, the Fear 3 story doesn't start here, it starts with the tie-in prequel comic. Okay, so you know how in Fear 1 it ends with Alma climbing into the chopper, and then there was that DLC that explains what happens afterwards that got decanonized? Well, this prequel comic tells us what happened instead of Extraction Point. In the monolith timeline, Point Man's chopper crashes, and with his mask being damaged, the man of Point tears it off to the reveal that he's... John Wick? Yeah. The chopper then explodes and he wakes up to find Paxton Fettel standing over him. Point Man runs away through the streets for a bit and is then kidnapped by Armor Cam. So yeah, that's how Point Man got from Fear 1 to Fear 3 and I gotta say I'm a little bit more of a fan of these version of events over the uh, 9 page comic but hey. Maybe that's just me. Anyway, so the game actually begins nine months after the comic. We see Point Man is being interrogated by Armor Cam, who wants to know where Jin is hiding in Fairport for some reason. Paxton then shows up, possessing a guard and killing the other one, giving Point Man a chance to get free. And from here, our objective seems to become escape the prison, get to Fairport and save Jin, which is much to Paxton's dismay. I agree we must escape, but for her. Also, first nitpick of the game, the Armor Cam guys wanted to know where Jin was and seemed to have her radio frequency but didn't have her location. However, the second we get into the game, one of these armor cam earpieces has Jin sending out a distress call on it, saying that she's hiding in Fairport's underground tunnels. Like, why were you interrogating Point Man? It is blatantly obvious that the story of fear has been put through a blender of rewrites multiple times because as you'll see, objectives don't stay consistent, characters don't stay consistent. Hell, why are we going through this with a fine tooth comb? The story itself becomes a barely strung together series of events near the end. It's it's incredible. It's a masterclass of shit writing. Anyway, blasting our way through the prison, the first thing I want to talk about right away is the gameplay. Because if we take out all the expectations of how a fear game is meant to play, this thing has the best moment to moment in the series. Please don't unsubscribe, please. Point Man and Paxton's gameplay is the best stuff in this game. And that's kind of surprising considering that Day One didn't want to do co-op. The way the whole thing works is is that Point Man operates as a kind of heavy damage class, while Paxton plays more of a support role. With PM, he's got all the usual tricks. You've got a couple of kicks, some grenades, guns, and slow motion, which would be boring the third time around if it's not for Paxton's effect on how you utilize these skills. Paxton has a pretty wide range of abilities to choose from. In his basic form, he can throw out stun blasts, but the real interesting stuff comes from his alternate ability. Pressing right click honestly does a lot of things. You can pick up grenades, barrels, anything that goes boom when it lands, and you can lob them any way you want. Holding right click on Point Man gives him a shield for a few seconds, holding right click on an enemy will pull it into the air for an easy target, and pressing control while holding an enemy in the air will... Yep, Paxton can possess people. These possessed bodies are on a timer though, meaning you have to kill and collect enemy stoles to stay in your current body. Although I never really understood the incentive to do this, since if you get kicked out of one body, you can just jump into a new one pretty soon afterwards. So yeah, considering I have two sentences on Point Man's abilities and two paragraphs on Paxton's, it's pretty clear who is the real star of Fear 3. Although it's not just about who's got the most solo utility, since using teamwork in this game is, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, a little bit overpowered. <laughs> like I was saying earlier, it seems like Point Man gets left in the dust in this game, but that's kind of not true depending on how you play it. If you play this game as a true co-op game, Point Man is just one element of the team. He's your consistent, reliable damage output, and usually the focus of the fight. Paxton, on the other hand, has an extremely varied kit that makes him super powerful, but in a team setting, most of it is used with the 
the knowledge that point men will be getting hard focused by the AI. With your abilities, you have many choices on how you want to play off your partner. You could use Paxton's base offensive abilities and support shield to back up PM and work as an extra shooter while also mitigating any damage he might take to allow for more aggressive plays. You can run interference, possessing an enemy right in the middle of things and tearing up their formation from behind. Or you can do really anything. The fact that Point Man has a restrictive yet constant set of skills while Paxton has varying states of lethality allows for many options and team strategies. Strategies that the AI is not prepared for. So you know how I was talking about how these levels had to be retooled to allow for co-op? Well, it's kind of clear the enemy AI wasn't because if you work as a team in this game, instead of just shooting no matter what, this thing is bloody easy. I don't know if the GoApp system is still present in this game because the enemies once again lack options to move around in the levels, just like in Fear 2. There's also the added factor of Paxton. The AI just does not know how to handle a target just popping up right next to them, making them feel really, really stupid. Both Point Man and Paxton don't even need to respect the AI as much as the previous entries either. This is because the health kit system is gone, replaced with a Call of Duty type health regeneration. This means you can bum rush into any room, take a fuck ton of damage, but kill everybody, and it's all good. You don't have to think about how many med kits a high risk play will cost you. You don't have to think about if you should be using this much health in this area. This is because every fight is an individual trial where the game asks you if you can survive this one single room. And if you can, then good job. You get your health back and you get to continue. And it's not even like you have to survive the full room on one bar of health. If you're getting critical, just go hide in a corner, get back up to full health and get back in there. I'm telling you, man, the cards are so unbelievably stacked against the AI on this one. And I don't really know if anyone realized it during development. <laughs> but yeah, that's mostly what Fear 3's gameplay is. I'll be the first to say it's really fun and one of the best things in this game. Like I never rolled my eyes going into a fight because it just feels really good to play. It's completely possible that the gameplay with this one is what makes it good bad because while Paxton might be speaking the worst dialogue ever written, you're also having fun shooting enemies. Anyway, so after shooting our way through the prison for a bit, it starts to crumble around us and we fall through the floor into the sewers. But why is this happening you might ask? All squads and small arms fire and disruption from gas main intended as affecting nearby power lines. Take your fire. Ah, uh, yeah, a gas main just explodes because it does. And uh, yeah, don't ask questions. Watch this cool Bioshock 2 cutscene. I gave you life. I mold you. Create you. Anyway, making our way through the sewers and some admittedly nice looking level design, we're ambushed by armor cam soldiers. And yes, the guy that you can see in slow motion just got hit in the face. His reflexes are totally off the charts. But before Armor Cam can arrest us again, they're all killed by some strange skinny looking monster that even Alma, who also shows up here, seems pretty scared of. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I talked about Fear 2, there was a point when I felt I didn't have much else to say and began talking about what I didn't like in the game. Back in my Burial at Sea video, I didn't even do moment to moment story breakdown because it wasn't really something that benefited the video. And here, it's it's the same. I cannot give Fear 3 the retrospective treatment that I give other games. I've told you about the gameplay, but apart from that, there isn't much to this game. The story is disjointed, nonsensical, and it only really progresses during the beginning and end of a level. Which is really impressive because this game is four hours long, and yet a whole lot of nothing happens, so we're going to be changing gears. We have officially covered everything I think is pretty good about this game, and now all that's really left is the story that shits all over the pre-existing canon. So what we'll be doing now is we'll be quickly going through the story, which shouldn't be hard because there isn't much that's going on here. And I'm going to tell you why this thing is so 
awful. So picking back up in the sewers, we exit it and we spend the rest of the level fighting through a Brazilian looking town before hijacking an armor cam helicopter and flying it to Fairport. On our way, a shockwave hits the helicopter and we crash into a department store where we have to fight against armor cam and cultists who have been driven insane by Alma. Through the level, we're attacked by the skinny creature a little more and once we exit the store, Paxton reads some cult scribbles and is suddenly very excited ending the chapter. Come. In the next one, the brothers roll up to the suburbs to find Jin, only to find that Army Cam is killing all the civilians in the area. And I bet you won't guess what we do for the whole level. Yep, we fight cultists and Army Cam. The skinny monster once again shows up to fight us, and it's revealed that it's Harlan Wade. And I will be talking about that point later. You better believe that. Paxton once again tells Point Man that he shouldn't be trying to save Jin, but conveniently, Jin radios in, telling everybody exactly where she is. So setting off, we fight some more Army Cam dudes and enter the tunnels where we find Jin. Jin. You. I knew you were alive. You'd come for me. All right. Yeah. Course. It turns out that she has some data that could ruin Armor Cam, and that data is uh, info on Michael Beckett, which is him saying that Alma is pregnant. Now at this point shit starts getting really wild and I think they might have stopped caring around this part because it's never even explained in the actual story but we're told in a little piece of text at the start of the next level that we need to find Beckett to find Alma for some reason. So heading off into the city, Jin gets kidnapped by some cultists and we have to go rescue her by, say it with me now, fighting through area after area of armor cam soldiers and cultists. In this level the game also tries to establish a villain with the phase commander being introduced as someone who has a very special interest in killing Point Man. Sometime during the level, we hear over the radio that Jin has been kidnapped from the cultists by Armor Cam, and the phase commander is now using her as bait for Point Man. So finding our way through Armor Cam and cultists, we run into Harlan Wade again, he talks some shit, and we finally make it to a tower where there's a giant rift opening over it for some reason, but that's not important because we get into a boss fight with the big man himself, the phase commander. That's it. Killing him, another guy that sounds just like him and also hates Point Man just as much shows up. Killing him as well, Jin sends us off in an escape pod to go find Beckett. On the way to the airport where he's being shipped off, our pod crashes when another Alma energy surge hits it, and we spend the level fighting army cam dudes and weird dog enemies. This one is a little cooler since both Point Man and Paxton get an EPA, and in this game they've even added a shield feature. But we don't get to ride in them for long as the bridge we're stomping along collapses collapses, sending Point Man tumbling down into the ocean. If this is part of your plan, then I'd say things are going quite swimmingly. <laughs> Okay, now we have been moving very fast, but I do want to put on the record that for the most part, most of the level transitions from one to the next have been, you know, more or less smooth. Well, I do have a question now. Do you think that after falling in the ocean, there's gonna be a smooth transition to the next level or not? Place your bets, let's see. <laughs> You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. So in the airport level, I don't really even need to say it. All you really do is fight armor cam dudes and nothing else really happens. Another phase commander does show up that hates Point Man just as much as the last two guys did. And we fight two more of them after this guy as well. Eventually we make it to the runway and fighting two more phase commanders, we finally make it to Beckett. And this scene is absolutely the reason why they hired famous director John Carpenter because it's not wasteful of characters, it's not bad writing or anything, it's just, it's perfect. Beckett is still pretty angry about what Alma did to him. Paxton then possesses Beckett and tells us everything about Project Harbinger that we already knew from the last game. He then dives into Beckett's memories again and witnesses from Beckett's perspective his own mum. I'm not even gonna finish that sentence, what the fuck? Paxton then finds what he needs, kills Beckett and gives us a really good Joker laugh. <laughs> In the next level, we pick up in an underground armor cam facility that was under Harlan Wade's house or something. I, 
I, I don't even know. I don't even know how we got here. Also, I haven't really mentioned it yet, but between levels, we get a little Paxton narration over security footage showing Point Man and Paxton growing up together. And in this level, we have traveled back to this facility we've seen in these cutscenes to destroy all of our bad memories. Hey, don't look at me like that. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what happened in the story. <laughs> Through the level, we're attacked by this skinny monster multiple times as the brothers destroy the memories of the things Harlan did to them. The level end game ends with a giant Harlan Wade monster boss fight and killing him Paxton says that they can finally see Alma now that the past isn't in their way anymore. Huh? Arriving at Alma's location, I, I don't even know what's going on here, but Paxton wants to eat Alma to gain unlimited power, while Point Man just wants to kill her and the child. What are you doing? This family never meant anything to you. Are you going to continue to follow the orders of that woman, or stay true to your own blood? The brothers then fight and the game tallies up each player's points through the game. Oh yeah, that's also something I didn't mention. Through the game, you get points by absorbing dead bodies and completing challenges. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most points wins. In Fettel's ending, he possesses Point Man and promises to raise Alma's child as his own. He then, um eats Alma and that's it. In the Point Man ending, it's a little different but not much. Point Man puts three more bullets into Paxton's head, killing him. He then helps Alma deliver the baby before Alma herself dies. And Point Man leaves as Jin radios in saying things are going back to normal. And that is the story of Fear 3. Time to complain. The story of Fear 3 is one of the worst constructed, most embarrassing attempts at creating a trilogy I think I have ever seen in video games. It doesn't know what it wants to do. It doesn't know what it wants to be. The game totes itself through its cutscenes as some deep reflection on what it means to be family, but it falls flat because that is not what Fear is about. Now, before we actually get into the actual characters, can we just talk about how hideous all of the characters actually look in this game. Like, what happened here? They've pushed Paxton's hairline up a couple of inches, Jin looks like she's a walking, talking doll, and Point Man, holy fuck, what, what is wrong with his model? Every time I see this thing, I think I'm going crazy because no one else seems to see how hideous this guy is. It's weird because he looks fine in live action, his model looks fine in promotional stuff, but in game and in cutscenes, I, like, I, I don't even know what to say. Why are his eyes so lifeless? Like the phase commander calls Point Man an inbred multiple times in the game and it has me wondering if this horrible face was a deliberate design choice or not. Like, someone tell me I'm not alone here. You are listening, aren't you? I have I can't find anyone that agrees with me. The only place on the internet that seems to have something to say about Point Man's face is this Reddit post that says he looks like the guy from Ice Age. But moving past the looks, I want to talk about the actual characters in the game. And let's get started with Paxton. Last time we saw this guy was in Fear 2 Reborn when he gets resurrected into the body of Foxtrot 813. But this game ignores that DLC in both the comic and the game. Like in the first cutscene, Paxton Paxton literally explains how he's still alive. When my brother found me, he put a bullet in my head, but our psychic link never broke. So it didn't have anything to do with the fact that you transferred your consciousness into a replica body. Okay. Another bit of evidence is that in the prequel comic written by Steve Niles, right after the chopper crashes, Paxton shows up to taunt Point Man. But there is no way he could be alive at this point since the replicas hadn't reactivated yet and Fear 2 Reborn can only happen after the point in Fear 2 when the replicas activate in Interval 4. So Fear 3 absolutely ignores the only interesting part of Fear 2. And if you need any more evidence on why Paxton is not possessing the body of Fox, Trot 813 even though he should be I present to you this guy's massive bullet hole in his head what else do you need now I want to talk about Paxton's personality too but to do that we need to talk about point man's because through the campaign this is the only guy Paxton yaps onto really a big problem with point man is that he is still a nothing character he is canonically mute and now his character is actually a huge part of the story but what story Paxton spends a lot of the game talking 
fucking to Point Man about family. But what are you talking about, dude? Think of it like this. Point Man knows Paxton from the one day he spent chasing him in Fear 1. And he also knows Alma from the one day she spent chasing him around in Fear 1. Fear 3 all of a sudden establishes that Point Man and Paxton grew up together until PM was 11 and Paxton was 10. As far as I can tell, Paxton kind of went catatonic after the synchronicity event. But, but what about Point Man? All I can really find is that he was sent off into the military. There's no reason he shouldn't remember Paxton. But either way, in Fear 1, it's pretty heavily established and implied that these two motherfuckers don't really know each other. I mean, isn't that the point of the game? One of the big reveals at the end is that Paxton Fettel is Point Man's brother, and this was their first time really figuring that out. You and I were born from the same mother. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that one of the elements of the reveal in Fear 1? How weird it is that they're brothers and yet they know nothing of each other? Isn't that also the connection that Point Man had to Alma? One of the aspects of that reveal was that she's his mother, and he's never met her. Is, is it, wasn't that what this is about? But now it's like, we've known each other for years. By the end of the first game, we know they're brothers, but they're not brothers, just like Alma is PM's mother, only in a biological sense. What's clear is that we have a massive ambiguity issue here. We don't know how Point Man feels because he doesn't talk, and we really don't know much of his history. As well as that, we don't know how Paxton feels because his character is pretty inconsistent in this series. This makes the main debate in the story kind of hollow. Paxton is trying to establish something with Point Man, but all Point Man can do is give him a mean look for the whole thing because, you know, why not? There's no tension here because character conflicts in stories only works when you know things about your characters. The audience must have some knowledge about both of the characters that are clashing and they need to give both characters the ability to add new cards onto the deck that is your conflict. But we don't know much about point man and he doesn't have the ability to express himself making this main kind of debate about the uh, importance of family a little bit useless because only Paxton can keep going oh you're such a bad brother and well point man he can't even say like Dude, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> it's kind of like if Valve ever tried to make Alex and Gordon Freeman an official couple. They can't because it'll imply that Gordon is a character with his own thoughts and feelings and suddenly the player will be a part of this story where they're only getting one side of this entire interaction. It's really strange that the whole story is about family when Paxton is the only one that can really actually contribute anything. These guys don't trust each other. You have one brother who's effectively mute and he's a super soldier and dangerous and brooding and you have the other brother who is a psychopath and one killed the other. So you put those together and you get a pretty good story. <laughs> wow! Oh, that's some kind of logic right there. Point Man doesn't talk, Alma barely shows up in the game and barely does anything, and Harlan Wade isn't even real. Oh yeah, that's something we haven't talked about yet. Harlan Wade and character assassination. Now I cannot believe I'm about to defend Harlan here, but he is portrayed as comically evil in this game. Pretty much, Skinny Monster Thing is called The Creep, and it's a manifestation of the memory of Harlan Wade, and that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Through the game, Harlan non-stop taunts you, calling the brothers failures, and he just doesn't shut up. He's not even saying any valid points. He's just saying evil, nasty things because the game wants to tell you that he's an evil and nasty guy. I gave you my Okay, I just want to lay this out real quick. Harlan Wade is a bad guy. In the law, he canonically hands over his daughter to the corporation he works for in order to study her abilities. He then uses her to create two prototypes, which he uses to try and benefit this corporation. He's a piece of shit. There's no two ways around it. This game not only brings him back as the main villain after he died an entire game ago, but they dive into a Harlan Wade character study where the only finding is that Harlan is a piece of shit. The game James says, look, Harlan experimented on kids. Look how mean he is, and look how he's not even remorseful now. What? 
Harlow Wade is the only reason Alma was released from the Origin facility. He was so guilt ridden about what he did to Alma that he released her at the expense of his own life. Did they forget about that fact? If you want to do a Harlan Wade character study, you shouldn't be telling us what we already know. Personally, I'm more interested in the other side of this whole thing. Why is Harlan the way he is? What made him the kind of guy that would experiment on his own daughter? Like if you're gonna resurrect the character, why not tell us something new about him rather than how mean he was? Also, why did he feel so guilty about what he did to Alma, but he didn't seem to care about his two sons slash grandsons that he kept in his basement for like 10 years? Also, just another bit of salt on the wound, when you defeat Harlan at the end of the game, he says this. My children, Alma, you were to be my legacy, but you are all monsters. I absolutely hate this because this is Harlan's final send off in the series and he's pretty much saying, I regret nothing, this is all your fault, goodbye. That is not Harlan's character at all. Somehow they've taken a guy whose whole character arc was that he was completely guilty and remorseful about what he did to Alma and they have taken the story arc that he had in both Fear games and they've just undone it. How did they undo it? They made a fake version of the character and they made him not remorseful for anything the real one did. Like, what are the stakes here? You've beaten an imaginary version of a person? This is like me having an imaginary argument with someone in the shower and winning. Like, it means nothing. If you're going to try and say that Harlan Wade, this was who Harlan Wade was, then you've just gone and disregarded his whole actual character. I just don't know why you had to scrounge around in the lore, find a dead character, undo his story, story just to make him the main villain when you have a good main villain right in the game called the phase commander that they completely waste. For a little refresher, the phase commander is the guy you run into in the city level. And when he's introduced, it seems like he might be the big bad of the game. For the whole level, he's talking about how Point Man is a mistake, that he needs to be erased. He talks like he has some kind of personal stake in all this. He even kidnaps Jin to force Point Man to come to him. Like that is some arch nemesis stuff right there, man. Just ignore the fact that Point Man's canonically only worked with Jin for like one week in the universe. He barely knows her, but whatever. But yeah, you fight the phase commander, you kill him, and then another rolls up. I just don't get it because the multiple phase commanders that show up in the game do the whole shit talking thing with Point Man, and yet they're all apparently different guys. This legitimately feels like a mistake. Like the phase commander originally had to be one guy and had a way bigger role. Personally, and this is just an idea, but why not make him Beckett? In the game, Beckett shows an extreme disgust towards Point Man and his whole family. Like he's got the motive to hate Point Man and hunt down Alma, right? WB, hire me as a writer. Actually, wait, don't, I don't wanna work for you. Speaking of Beckett, what the fuck? Good old Mike has to be the worst treated protagonist in gaming history. Like the dude goes through Fear 2, is held captive for nine months, and then these two goobers show up and kill him just to find out where Alma is. But can we pause here for a second? How? would Beckett know where Alma is? On the security cameras, it seems like she dipped right after the final scene of Fear 2. So how, just how would possessing Beckett and looking through his memories get them anywhere? It, it's not even explained at any point during the game. And I mean, what am I really surprised for? There is no part of this campaign that is shown in the cutscenes or the gameplay that serves as a logical progression for the campaign. I mean, just Think about it. Point Man and Paxton have to find Jin, so they fly to Fairport, they fuck around for a bit until they hear from her again and head into the tunnels. Jin then says, holy crap guys, Alma's pregnant and she's gonna tear Fairport apart if we don't find her. Good thing we know where Beckett is, go find him. We then chase a kidnapped Jin all through Fairport and once she's rescued, she sends us off to find Beckett like she'll be okay in this city that is literally falling apart around her. Once we make it to Beckett, Paxton possesses him and it's just like, yeah, this is the father. And somehow because of this information, they automatically know that they have to go to the facility where they grew up as kids. Like these guys go from the middle of the city, which was crawling with armor cam, by the way, to the middle of the woods with no indication of how we got there or, you know, why we're even there. We then have to defeat the bad memories of Harlan Wade before we can finally see Alma. Like, am I missing some crucial bit of lore here? Nothing in this game 
game makes any sense. It's just a bunch of loosely strung together scenarios that is justified by poorly written characters that just spell out the obvious. How the fuck did we actually get from the quality of writing and depth of story and gameplay and graphics and ambience of Fear 1 to this piece of shit? That this doesn't even feel real. It does not feel like a real game. Hey guys, B4 Brandos from the future. I'm going to interrupt this video to bring you something I have just found. So I was looking around on the internet for some footage to put over the day one part of my video. And I found this old promotional channel for Fear 3. Now this channel is a treasure trove of Fear 3 development footage. There is so much on this, but we have this guy, community manager named Anthony Williams, who I think manage this channel. Now, Anthony did a bunch of stuff, did a bunch of these promotional videos, but he did something called the Day One Studios Virtual Tour. Now, a lot of this tour is pretty normal. He just goes around to all the different departments, shows everybody what's going on. Not only do they have a full-size mirror I can check myself out with, they also animate the models, they're living. But at the end of the tour, he goes to the big boss's office and he looks at a script page on the wall, which shows how unbelievably different this game was meant to be. Now, this was about a year before Fear 3 actually released, but this shows just how extensive the rewrites were. Let's go through this. So this scene seems to pick up in the power station. So this is the part of the game where you actually meet up with Jin, except here, it looks like Jin and Kira Stokes from Fear 2 bust through a door with their rifles shouldered. All of a sudden, dust swirls through the beams of their flashlights. Jin says, damn it, Beckett is not here. We have to secure the implantation from his encounter with Alma in the reactor. So we're assuming that's the end of Fear 2. Stokes says, the exchange went both ways, as well as causing a great deal of physical damage and mental deterioration. All of a sudden, Michael Beckett says, a loving encounter with greatness would change you too. Jin and Stokes turn to see Alma walk out of the shadows as fire burns around her. She, and this part is crazy. She holds a leash in each hand. One is attached to Beckett, who is pregnant and scarred by psychic energy. And Point Man, long-haired and bearded, is attached to the other. Alma then speaks, but it is in the voice of Fettel. And she says, welcome ladies. Point Man then pulls out his leash and it snaps. He runs after Jin and Stokes. It then cuts to gameplay. So this single page is insane. It shows just how different the game was meant to be and how obvious it is that rewrites just happen on the fly. I mean, Kira Stokes, who in the monolith timeline is officially dead because she doesn't show up. She's here in this game. It seems like Jin has a lot more to do with this. And it, it even seems like maybe the campaign might have been you playing as Jin and Stokes. Also, Beckett is the one that is pregnant in this version. Like, holy crap, man. This, is, this game is just something else. Anyway, I don't really know what to do with this information. It sounded like the previous version of the script either was going to be like balls to the wall insane and would have been awesome or would have been fucking horrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, past B4 Brandos, uh, keep complaining. Another bone I have to pick with this game is a rather simple question. Where the hell is Fear? Yeah, Fear. You know the organization that the games are named after? In Fear 1, you played as an operative. Nice. In the non-canon expansions, you were still an operative. Nice. In Fear 2, they thought they weren't allowed to use that word, so you play as a Delta Force operator. Okay. But in Fear 3, there is nothing stopping them from reintroducing the organization. I can deal with the fact that you don't play as one of their agents. I can deal with the fact that Point Man isn't in it anymore. But what do you mean they don't show up at all? It's, it's almost like they're embarrassed to talk about it. It's really weird. Jin introduces herself as a fear operative on the radio. The phase commander calls both Point Man and Jin fear operatives. But where has fear actually gone? What is Jin still doing in the city? Did fear just leave after the origin explosion? Did fear leave Jin there? Was Jin there on a mission? If so, what was it? Like seriously, where is fear? Are you telling me you have access to this organization and you're not going to use it in the game? Another thing the series has lost here is quite a bit of atmospheric identity. Fairport has never been the focus of the fear games. It's just a nothing city to serve as a backdrop for the game.
But as the games have gone on, the city has developed a bit of a personality in my opinion. A personality that is fully stripped away in Fear 3. The ambience is just gone. The urban decay that was present in the earlier games is gone. That dark, suffocating vibe that Fairport gives off is no longer there. There's barely any continuity between Fear 2's Fairport and this one, because I'll tell you, this place sure as hell does not look like a new kitty. Fear overall just does a lot of losing. It loses the atmosphere, it loses the tension, it misses the chance to pursue interesting ideas like the Almaverse. And yes, I haven't brought up the Almaverse before, but this is pretty much how all of the paranormal monsters in the games exist. Alma's psychic abilities gives her a connection to another universe. It's kind of like a strange corrupted version of our world. The best example would be the upside down in Stranger Things, and yet it is never explored as a concept. Even in this game, where Alma is literally ripping the veil between her world and ours in half, no one seems to give a shit about the actual interesting storytelling opportunities here. It feels so weird that Fear 3 is a competent shooter, and yet everything else that it tries to do is overshadowed by its blatant disregarding of everything that came before it. It's like it doesn't even want to be a Fear game, and that would make sense, it's not really even that scary. They hire me to write scary things, and then when you write something scary, they're like, oh, we can't, you know, that's too much. And I didn't have that with these with these guys. Hey, I'm not surprised. The worst crime it commits is that it tries to draw on the nostalgia of the previous game's plots without committing to the specifics of the lore they created. It's downright a baffling piece of media to compare to the previous two games. But hey, let's take it back a gear here because you're not gonna believe this. Fear as an organization actually does show up in the game. It's just in the multiplayer. And now you're double not gonna believe this. Multiplayer is actually the best part of Fear 3. As opposed to the previous games, Fear 3 embraces its co-op aspects, instead of just going for your run-of-the-mill PvP slog. In total, there are four game modes, Contractions, Soul King, Soul Survivor, and Fucking Run. Yep, that's the actual name of the game mode. Starting off, Contractions is COD Zombies, there's nothing else to it. You survive waves and waves of armor cam soldiers, and occasionally there will be a round where Alma Dogs come after you. There are a few things here that stop this from being a COD Zombies clone though. Weapons can't be bought but instead need to be found. Between waves you can find yellow and red crates spread around the arena. Yellow restocks your holdout while red adds new weapons. The last cool thing about this mode is that sometimes you can even see Alma walking around and if you stare at her she'll damage you and teleport you to some random point in the map. So yeah, cool stuff, like it. Soul King is my favorite game mode, and in it you take control of a Spectre, which is a spirit who has a watered down version of Paxton's abilities. And your goal here is to compete against other players playing as Spectres and collect the most souls. The way you do this is by possessing NPCs and, well, killing other NPCs. And if you come across another Spectre or a Spectre possessing a body, it turns into a kind of PvP deal. After that, there's not a whole lot to it. It's just really fun. The Spectre design is horrifying and I love how much they yap throughout the rounds. All the joys of a beating heart. This one will do nice. Soul Survivor is a PvPVE game mode. Pretty much a majority of players play as fear operatives who need to defend themselves until extraction arrives, while one other person plays as a spectre whose job it is to corrupt the team. You can do this by possessing NPCs, downing team members, and then turning those members into spectres. And I could see it being fun, but I just didn't have enough players in the match to get the full experience. Finally, fucking run is what it sounds like. There's a wall of death behind you, you have to run away, and on the path there is a bunch of NPCs PCs that try to kill you. It's okay, but I will say it's one of the worst game modes. Not because it's bad, it's just not very interesting. And that could be said for a lot of my Fear 3 multiplayer experience, because this thing has been well and truly left to rot. I don't know what kind of server in the abandoned day one offices is still keeping this game alive, but trust me, it's on its last legs. If you play Fear 3 today, you are not going to be able to get into co-op without some serious determination. For whatever reason, the servers allow players to be connected for around two minutes before booting them out of the game, no matter what. So getting the footage for this multiplayer 
multiplayer section was really hard because there's no land mode and out of the three others I had trying to play, the server eventually only accepted one. This is the same for the campaign as well. When I streamed this game with my friend Preston, shameless plug, go check out B5 Brandos if you want to see the highlights. We spent an entire hour trying to get this thing to work because the only strategy that lets you play is brute force. As long as you keep reconnecting, once you get into a lobby that lets you stay for five minutes, you're good. But I was determined. I was doing this for a video. Any like average dude that wants to play Fear 3, they're pretty much being told no at the door. So yeah, that's Fear 3. It's weird because I thought this video would be longer. I thought I'd have more to say, but after playing all the games these last few weeks, I've found that there's just not much to say once you get to this point. WB took a studio and forced it to throw out what it had to make this game, but they weren't happy even with that. Everything needed to be what was cool with the kids. Less horror, more co-op, make it more like Call of Duty. There's so little to say about Fear 3 because it's not really a fear game, it's, it's a ripoff. It's a shallow imitation of a series of games that are way better than itself. Fear 2 looks like a fucking masterpiece compared to Fear 3, and it's just downright depressing. People that had no business giving input on this game got an insane amount of control over it. And when it failed because of their input, they just backed up and said, Fear must just not be popular anymore. Yeah, it's just sad and disappointing because it's such a clear example of not living up to the legend. All those questions posed, all those stories, threads that were set up in Fear 1 are either thrown away by this point or they're answered in a way that tells me nothing other than the fact that the person coming up with those answers and resolutions doesn't give a shit about any of this. Fear 3 is embarrassing. It's disrespectful to the legacy of the series. It's just really bad in a way that can be fun in the moment, but in the grand scheme of the series, it just comes off as being kind of pathetic. And because of that, because of everything I've talked about, I am giving Fear 3 a 2 out of 10. I'm really shocked at some of the stuff they, they let us get away with. Me too, kid. And that's the Fear series, and it looks like we've talked about every game, so I think we're just a- Hello? Oh. The audience will riot if I don't talk about it. Okay. You guys ever heard of something called Fear Online? So Fear 3 was not actually the last time the IP was in use. That honor goes to the now defunct 2014 game called Fear Online. Now I want to give you an idea of the Fear landscape at this time. Monolith was pretending Fear 3 never happened. Timegate Studios, the people who made the original expansions, went bankrupt the previous year. Day One Studios doesn't exist and has been bought up by the world of tanks people. The Fear IP at this point is considered shit. Every developer that's ever touched it that isn't Monolith doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't bring success. But there was a brave little studio that rejected this. A little dev studio called InPlay Interactive that endeavored to create an online fear experience. Now this thing will go down as one of the most poorly documented fear games out there because despite my best efforts, there is no way to play this game at all because the servers are down meaning you can't get any of the content but after doing some research i have found some info fear online had two modes pvp where it was delta force and fear versus armor cam and co-op where there were three co-op story missions to play one took place in a new york armor cam facility another took place in a random tunnel and the third took place on still island during the events of fear 2. as far as i can tell these weren't meant to be canon and honestly weren't really interesting interested in telling a story, but I still find the opening cutscene really funny, like how intense do you need your zoom to be? <laughs> From the research I have done, it definitely seems like Fear Online earned its fate. It was a free to play shooter, but you needed tickets to play matches. And you guessed it, you could either buy these tickets or you could wait a day to get a new one. Like someone told me that is not the worst free to play model you've ever heard of. So yeah, that was what Fear Online was. And it's kind of sad that the series went out not only with a whimper, but with a shitty cash grab game. Oh, and if you're wondering about the Fear IP curse, InPlay Interactive is seemingly 
still around, but their website is pretty broken right now and it seems like they haven't done anything since 2020. So who knows, maybe the last bastion has fallen here. Okay, let's wrap this up. We have finally made it to the end of our journey. Through this series or through this hours long video, we've looked at where Fear started, where they tried to take the sequel and what could have been with the expansions of the original. We've analyzed the mishandling of the IP by the publishers with Fear 3 and quickly looked over the dying embers of the series that Fear Online represented. And all up, I have to say that this series makes me feel sad. Back in the day when I was playing these iconic series on my crappy laptop, people would ask me about the game series I liked. And I'd tell them, I like Half-Life, I like Bioshock, I like fear? It was strange because with that original entry, with that first exposure, you could feel that this was meant to be one of the greats. This series could have been about far more than just Armor Cam and Alma and Point Man. It could have been special, long running and respected, but instead it wound up here. I can't say I fully loved the Fear series because I know that all the potential I felt in the first game peters out into nothing. There's no payoff, there's no satisfying conclusion, there's just the skeleton of an IP that a publisher saw money in. Fear as a series shows that it is possible to fumble success. No matter how well you make something, you always have to put in the effort for the next one. Nothing is guaranteed with video games, especially not success. Personally, this is just wishful thinking on my part, but I'd like to see a reboot of the series one day. Not a reboot that treads old ground, but a reboot that explores the original potential of the original concept. Imagine a game where you play as fear operatives, going from one paranormal encounter to the next. It would be awesome, and with today's current reboot culture, it is possible. But until then, fear is unfortunately an example of wasted potential. Hello everybody and thank you for watching the video, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna do the YouTuber thing now. Can you please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video? And if you really, really wanna see more videos from me, please click that bell notification so that you actually see when I make new videos. I don't know why YouTube says, oh, this guy subscribed, probably doesn't wanna see the next video. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, this has been a quite the journey to make all of these fear videos. It's uh, been a lesson in talking about things that I don't have, you know, insane passion about. You know, I, I usually do videos on things I have passion about. Fear 1, I'm very passionate about that. But the rest of this series, especially Fear 2, I, I really just don't really like that game. So this has been an excellent kind of journey on how to uh, talk about things from a more analytical perspective rather than just raw passion you know like oh this is what got me through my childhood that kind of thing so i hope you've all enjoyed it um more content coming soon obviously i'll let you go now uh go watch some other youtube videos i'll see you see you later <laughs>